You were 13 weeks old today, with your birth date marked on our calendar for May. At seven weeks, we saw your little heart beat at our very first scan. We started to tell our family and friends of our newly made plans. You're our first baby that we were so excited to meet. Everything was meant to be sweet. Instead, we left our second scan broken, fresh tears streaming down our faces. The news of your departure, that you only grew so old, will stay deep in our hearts and buried within our souls. No matter how long this baby is with you, they are a part of your whanau and they offer something and they changed the world and they had a place. And, uh, you know, people have different spiritual understandings of why babies come to us for just a short time. The second you discover you're pregnant, the moment you see that positive sign, you change your world to accommodate that, that baby. You make immediate life-changing decisions around this child. The second you discover it, your world changes. Um, so it matters. It really matters when, it, when you lose it. You feel connected with a baby. You feel one. You know, your whole whānau, a whole part of you at that moment when you know you're having a baby. So you get on the phone and you, you ring your husband to hunt, actually. This is what's happening. Um, we're not having a baby anymore. We don't actually entirely know how common miscarriages are, but the ones we do know about make up between about 15 and 24% of all pregnancies. So that's you know up to almost one in four pregnancies. But the reality is that actually there are probably more than that, and lots happen to women that didn't even know they were pregnant. We're diagnosing pregnancy a lot earlier now than we used to, and also the age of pregnancy is shifting upwards a little bit. And population and so they're probably genuinely getting more common but also being diagnosed more often. Didn't know it could happen. I didn't know miscarriage was a thing and I didn't know it was as common as it is. I just thought you just do the business, get the child, done. <laughs> but it's a lot harder than that, eh? We've had families tell us that because they were under that 12-week mark, um, there wasn't the support for them, they, there wasn't the the memory making service for them and they felt that they were really alone. After my loss, many dear friends said that, you know what, I've gone through the same process. And then I thought, oh no, oh wow, all of us, we have been suffering in silence for, for something that, I mean, no, it won't reduce our pain, but at least we see that we're not alone. Don't ever keep it to yourself because that's when all the, the guilt trip, yeah. all the time in the world when you start thinking and blaming yourself. And that's when things can get bad. I think it's so easy that you can blame yourself, you know, especially if you, you've done one thing or one thing you've kind of questioned that you've done that might have not been right. Like, you can easily blame yourself. Until you've been through pregnancy loss to yourself, it's probably quite hard to understand how hard it can be for some people. I mean, it's different for everyone. Often women are confused about this intense feeling of loss for someone that they never met. So the important thing is being able to talk about it for them to be able to understand and make sense of their thoughts and feelings. <laughs> もう
もちろん赤ちゃんのこともだけど人生は自分で変えられるっていうことも分かったし自分自身の内側といかに向き合って。Depending what culture you are, what ethnicity you are, what your religious or spiritual beliefs,、um, miscarriage can mean very different things, not only to you, but also actually to the community and the family you come from. We are a blended family, so this was the first one that we had that was ours.、Um, the children were devastated, they couldn't understand it. It was just a tangible idea. They knew I was pregnant, then all of a sudden, I wasn't anymore. And they didn't have anything to see or to hold apart from a solitary ultrasound picture. It doesn't matter how many children you've had or if it's your first, you know, once you do that test and you hear that you're pregnant or that you're having a baby, you automatically say to yourself that you're a parent. If it was more normal, like it was just like, yeah, if you have a miscarriage, of course you should have a week off work or two days off work, or of course you should. Go and find someone to talk to about it. But if you kind of don't know what you're supposed to do or what you're supposed to be feeling or what's it okay to do, if you're like me, you just power through it and you just think, well, maybe I'm supposed to just take it. To be in one of the worst times of your life when you're grieving and confused and no one really quite understands and to feel as though you're a little bit. Left on your own with not a lot of support. It was just really horrendous. My miscarriage happened in 2009, February of 2009. It was my third pregnancy. Lost my first baby early in pregnancy.、Um, I was really excited about being pregnant and.、Um, Because I have endometriosis, I didn't know whether I'd be able to have babies. As it turns out, I was very good at getting pregnant <laughs> because I ended up having,、uh, I've had seven pregnancies and one, one has survived. At nine weeks, we had a scan because I'd been bleeding and baby was there. And then at the 12 week scan,、um, the radiographer said that there was no heartbeat. But because I'd had two children, I could see this doesn't look right. How come we can't see a heartbeat? There are three different types of miscarriage that can happen. There are missed miscarriages, there are incomplete miscarriages, and there are complete miscarriages. So, if we think about complete miscarriages first, which is probably what people are most familiar with, a complete miscarriage is if you, you know you've got a pregnancy and you then sadly experience some bleeding, some cramps, and you may notice that you've passed something like a clot or some tissue, and then the bleeding and the cramps stop. Now, that's a miscarriage that is complete. An incomplete miscarriage is when you get bleeding and cramps,、um, and some of the tissue of the pregnancy will be passed, but not all of it. So, for women who experience an incomplete miscarriage, the bleeding and the pain may not stop, and you need to go and see a doctor, and there are certain things that they can do that will help the miscarriage sort of finish. Unfortunately, with those ones, they have an increased risk of infection as well. And so we're very careful of, of those women that we,、um, so they often come into hospital and we manage them in hospital. And then there's what's called a missed miscarriage. And that's where a woman may not have even known she was pregnant or, or may have known、um, and thinks that the pregnancy is continuing. And then there's nothing in terms of bleeding or pain at all. And they will only realise that the miscarriage has happened and the pregnancy has what we call failed、um, when they go to a doctor and get either a scan or a blood test that shows that they're no longer pregnant. I had absolutely no symptoms to tell me that I had miscarried.、Um, and we found out at our 13 week scan, we were, the baby had passed away at nine weeks, three days. The stories that I did hear were all the opposites of what I went through. The excruciating pain, the people thinking that they're going into labour, or a lot of blood clots, and I had none of those. So in my head, I was still trying to convince myself no, this can't be because it's not the things that you know that I knew about miscarriages at the time. Then there's what used to be called a blighted ovum, where the placenta and the fluid develops, but the baby doesn't develop inside. Some women find blighted ovum as a Um, negative term because they feel it's very much their baby, even though there wasn't a, an embryo developed. So we, we don't use that term as much as we used to. Mr. Oregon? 
There he is. Yeah. Now, <laughs> third miscarriage was after our son had been born. With that one, my body didn't deal with that miscarriage naturally, so that had to be medically managed in hospital and that was probably made it seem more, um, more it was harder to yeah. deal with, yeah. When I got told, for me, yes, massive shock, but at the same time, it kind of explained what, what, why I wasn't having heaps yeah. of symptoms and um, for Simon it was probably more of a shock for you. It was because I just walked in there expecting to see yeah. the baby. But. And he, his face was just just shock like yeah so that was hard to see him go through it as well. Mm. Yeah. Molar pregnancy is a pregnancy where so you basically have strong pregnancy symptoms but the pregnancy is not continuing as a normal pregnancy. So basically the tissue of pregnancy continues to divide very rapidly. And so the levels of the hormones of pregnancy, the levels continue to rise very, very quickly, abnormally. And so the woman has extreme symptoms of feeling very unwell. There's other early pregnancy losses as well. So probably most commonly people know about what's called an ectopic pregnancy where the pregnancy develops but not in the womb, not in the right place. So sometimes it can be in the fallopian tubes or something like that. And obviously that's not where it's supposed to grow and, and so it does need to be often surgically removed. If a woman has had a miscarriage, the outlook for the next pregnancy is, is in fact far better than she normally would imagine, even after two miscarriages. Um, and reassurance can be provided with an early ultrasound and if there is a baby's heartbeat then there's an 80 to 90 percent chance that pregnancy will continue despite any earlier miscarriages. We had the first two miscarriages before our firstborn and then we had our first child and then I was thinking we're fixed, like we're sweet now. And then to miscarry after having the first one I felt like we were going backwards in terms of trying to have kids and the fact that we had found out that we were pregnant and the joy around that and then finding out that we had lost a child was really, yeah, it was really heartbreaking. You know the term when they say she's lost the baby? I, I don't think that's a great term because I was thinking, well, I know exactly where the baby is. I didn't lose it. And I also didn't do anything per se that made this baby pass away. So I think and how we talk about it maybe insinuates a little bit of she lost the baby. There are so many, many reasons why you could lose a pregnancy and so often there's no reason that can be identified for it. So for a woman to feel shame or guilt or to be made to feel that way is unacceptable. I had an immediate family saying, you know, you were too involved in kapahaka. You were too involved in I'm um, going to the gym in the morning, babe. You, you weren't looking after yourself. And then, then you start to wonder, actually, was I? People are always under the impression that obviously that they've done something as a result of which they have miscarried. But most of the miscarriages are because of some chromosomal problems in the baby. So there is nothing that the patient does which can miscarry. The causes of miscarriages are mostly, I would say, unknown. I mean, I think that we have some theories around it. So it potentially could be divided into issues with the baby, issues with the mum, and then outside factors that can contribute. The most common identifiable cause is the egg not dividing when it's fertilised in a chromosomally stable way, and so getting additional chromosomes or missing chromosomes, which the body then recognises is not right, and the pregnancy will only progress to a certain point. Other times it can be for the mother, so that perhaps she's got some kind of metabolic disorder, there's hormone balances that aren't right in the pregnancy. It could also be that the woman has what we term an incompetent cervix, which is somebody who experiences the fact that their cervix doesn't remain closed and hold a pregnancy in the womb. And that's often quite tricky because it um, creates a sense of failure in the mums, and, and I think the terminology that we use enhances that a little bit. すごく自分が
悪いことをしている、うん、悪いことをしてしまったような気になって、うん、もう自分の人生で墓場まで一生その罪を持っていかなくてはいけないみたいな気持ちになって、うん、赤ちゃんはすごく欲しいんだけどでもすごく自分は悪い人間みたいな。ブレーキとアクセルが両方あるようないつもそういうものを抱えて楽しく日常を過ごしている時もいつも何か心の中にあるイミグランツ like us we are coming from a different culture、um, one challenge that I particularly had was trying to balance it within myself what I learned from my country of origin and what I learned from my new home in New Zealand So the conception around early pregnancy in, in our culture is that you don't do anything, you just rest, you go to your mom's place, they cook, they look after you, you don't even carry your shopping bag. Here, it's like, you're pregnant, you're not ill, you just go on with your life and this will help you with pregnancy. When I miscarried, I blamed myself a lot, thinking that You know,、um, all of that. Maybe I should have had rest. Maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe I shouldn't do that. I remember packing, packing our bags, and he told me not to do any heavy lifting and to take things easy. Me wanting to get things done, I just did it anyway. And then I started spotting. I felt a lot of guilt, especially because he had just the coincidence of the events that happened prior. And him telling me not to do anything, that he'll take care of it. I have yet to sit with a parent who's lost a baby who hasn't gone through the what if. So, if I didn't hang the washing, if I didn't lift that heavy box, if I didn't move the furniture,、um, if I hadn't gone swimming, you know.、Um, and so, I think all of those what ifs that people come up with are not known to cause a miscarriage. So, so most of the time you can quite confidently to say to a parent that this is not their fault. There's nothing that they've done to cause this to happen. I felt a huge sense of guilt and blame that I hadn't done my part. And I had done nothing wrong. And I know that in my head. And I know that logically there is nothing that I did or did not do that caused that miscarriage. It didn't change the fact that I knew it. I felt it in my heart. And it's a heavy burden to carry. I think hopefully reassuring for women to know that the vast, vast majority of miscarriages are kind of nature's way of saying this is a, a fetus or an embryo or a very, very, very early baby that was never going to be healthy enough to continue to full term. So it's nothing that they did, it's nothing that their body did, it was just the kind of makeup of the baby in the beginning. We never thought. It was our fault. We,、no. we just accepted the fact that it、does、probably.、Happen. Yeah, it does happen, and it was probably that there was something wrong with the baby. Many of this guilt,、um, feeling of guilt, feeling of shame,、um, they are coming from lack of information. So if we are allowed to talk about it,、uh, we can also share information. It's like becoming a parent. You, you don't know what. Being a parent's life, unless you are a parent. And you can talk to people who have, before they have kids about, oh, yeah, this and that, but you don't know until you know. And I think that's the same with miscarriage. You, you just have no idea what miscarriage is like until you've had one yourself or been through that experience. Whenever a patient is pregnant and starts bleeding, they must seek medical attention. If they have a midwife by then, they should go and see the midwife. Or A general practitioner, and if you know, if on the weekends, if that's not possible, if the GP practice is closed, then they should go to the nearest AE or emergency department in whichever, whichever area they are. For the very early pregnancies, before eight weeks, if there is not much material in the uterus, increasingly women are being offered the option to manage it conservatively, so not to come into hospital but to await. Miscarriage spontaneously. Some women prefer that. Other women prefer to have a scraping of the uterus, a DNC,、um, and especially if there's a large amount of pregnancy material, it's safer to, to do that.
One way of managing miscarriage is we give them medication to bring on the process so that, you know, whatever pregnancy tissues are left in the patient's uterus can be expelled out. I, first of all, chose the pills. Um, I didn't really have a chance to go talk to other people about that, but I took them and that I thought they worked, um, but they didn't. So I still had a little bit of the baby inside me and I was starting to have cramps and I was like, something's not right. So I went to the hospital, they did a scan and found that there was still blood supply going to that sort of area. And so I ended up having to have the DNC or APOP, which they call it. If you get pain, bleeding, and particularly dizziness or a symptom of kind of feeling faint, like you might collapse, and you haven't known your pregnancy was within the womb, then you do need to contact a doctor relatively urgently, just in case you're having an ectopic pregnancy. And if you get extremely heavy bleeding or pain at any stage, you're gonna to want to seek help and get some advice, but also as to whether or not you, you have had confirmation that the pregnancy was in the womb or it wasn't, to rule out that risk of ectopic. Once we got the um, information that we had miscarried Dougie, um, it was very, very fast, so we found out on the Thursday that um, our baby had no heartbeat, and on the Friday we were going in for surgery. So it was a very quick progression, there was no time to really adjust to emotions or feelings. We came home from the scan and we told the children. Uh, the next day we're ringing the hospital and they're saying, come in and we'll see if we can get your surgery done today. Um, they talked to us about the options and everything like that, but there wasn't much discussion around what happens afterwards. The hardest thing is sometimes for us, because we're health professionals, is that we're often very, very busy people. And you might have four women who are miscarrying, you know, who are actually sitting there in your clinic or in emergency department. So for us, it's, it's what we do every day. And we try and remove the emotions from our work that we need to do to make sure that the patient's looked after well. I didn't have any symptom. I just passed out twice. So I went to an after hour clinic, it was weekend. And they checked me, they said everything seems to be fine. And when we went to do the ultrasound, uh, then, then we learned that that was a missed miscarriage. So they sent us to emergency. But we didn't know at that time that there was a pregnancy center in the hospital. And we were admitted towards the emergency system. And they treated us as their protocols, thinking that, OK, well, yes, you had a miscarriage and you should, you should wait until the, you know, your body naturally processed that. It was really hard to explain um, that we were like, it's, it's not the, you know, the miscarriage. And um, I remember Rus told them that we are not here for free Panadol. <laughs> um, so it, it took us a while. It was, it was a bumpy road to get the right diagnosis. Every woman who's pregnant will get a whole lot of blood tests done, checking for all sorts of different things. But one of the things they're checking for is whether or not you are rhesus negative or positive. And that's part of your blood type. So for example, if you're O positive, that means you're rhesus positive. If you're O negative, that means you're rhesus negative. Um, and during pregnancy, it's important to know about that because if you are a rhesus negative woman and you have a miscarriage, it's really important you get what's called an anti-D shot in the first 72 hours after the miscarriage or even after a threatened miscarriage actually. So even after some bleeding that doesn't continue to be a miscarriage um, because that will help prevent any issues with your next pregnancy. So it's an immunoglobulin which we give patients who are Rh negative because if the patient's partner is Rh positive, and if the pregnancy continues where they've had bleeding, some Rh positive cells can go into the patient's blood, and that can form antibodies, which can cause problems in the subsequent pregnancy. So when we give anti-D, we inhibit that whole process to cause problems in the subsequent pregnancies. I was worried about my future pregnancies, what is, what if I lose, what, what if I cannot have a baby ever again because of all this miscarriage and infection and then all the side effects that could have been avoided?
We found that through our experience with the loss of Dougie and what we needed afterwards, when we were given the fatal diagnosis for Archer and we had some time to prepare before we had him, we were able to line up a lot more support straight away because we had more knowledge of what we were actually going to need. Openly grieving in front of the children was very beneficial because we could tell them today's a rough day and they could tell us today's a rough day. The grief really surprised me how deep it was because I'd been really worried about how do you go from two to three children? What am I, is this a great idea? What am I doing? And I felt guilty for all that doubt and what that had maybe impacted um, upon our baby. When you lose a baby in the first trimester, people think, um, and mothers think often, it's not a baby yet, you know, it's, it's not a baby until you've hit the 12 week mark. Um, and, and especially if you lose it, I think, uh, in the first sort of five or six weeks, you can easily think, it's not a baby. It's, I shouldn't get overwrought and worked up about this, but of course it is a baby. When someone comes to you and says, Frances, you know, she's only, had, she's only been eight weeks. I must carry that five months now. Come on, she should be able to handle this. You know, that, uh, you know, you really don't want that around you. You just, you almost want to grab something and just whack them over. With any loss, we grieve. And there is a range of emotions that go with that grief. So passionate sadness, guilt, anger, resentment, maybe resentment of other women that are pregnant, that they see that perhaps can easily become pregnant. When I'd see other women with their babies, I'd go through different emotions. Um, as if I, got really upset about it. I'll just think back to how lucky I am, fortunate that I've got one already. The worst moment was when our dog got pregnant. <laughs> I just remember thinking, the dog can do it, why can't I? When if people who are similarly aged to you, you're trying to have kids and you've reached that point in your life where you're like, I'm gonna start a family and then you're not having kids, but then your mates or people you know are having kids and then they're having two kids and you're still waiting on your first and you're like, oh man, like, Yeah, not like wrong? it's a competition, but yeah. it's, you're but, just watching what you want, what you had in your head, yeah. that's what's gonna happen for us yeah. and then it does, it's not happening and it's yeah. as happy as you are for other people, it is hard yeah. when you feel like you're missing out. Yeah. Oh, and you're asking yourself like, what's wrong with me? Or what's wrong with us? Like. Is there something we're doing or we're not doing that they're doing, that they're having kids and we're not? It's normal to feel all of those things and that every woman and couple's experience is unique. So grief is like a fingerprint. It's very different for everyone. Some people um, cope with the support of um, family um, and their friends, but um, others find that um, that it's a very um, lonely experience. I know I fell into a depression. Um, I remember binge drinking too, trying to find an excuse to catch up with everyone just to drink my sorrows away. It was a different kind of grief I never experienced before. For two, three days, nothing made sense. Um, I felt that I was covered in fog. Everything was so foggy. I was seeing everything behind a cloud. I felt distance from everyone except him. I think in my darkest moment of that time, um, I felt that Beruz is the only one in the whole world who can really understand my pain because uh, we are in this together. I can imagine that it must have been very hard on him as a man who wanted to protect his family and now 
um, we lost a member. Emotionally, it is not as hard as it is for the mom. You try hard as a husband, you try hard to support the mom, but at the same time, you feel like you can't do much. I'm a strong man, but at that time, I couldn't do anything. You know, you'd like you want to do something, but I just felt weak, especially for, as a father. Um, yeah, I just didn't know what to do after that. I also feel sad, but I also have to think about how to support her. No, I, I don't know, I, I couldn't even think that much because... Actually, I, I cannot even believe, believe the baby was like gone. I hear that often from men that they feel that they have to hold it together for their partners. But when you, what is really important for them to remember is that because it's such an emotional experience for women, if they hear that their partner is struggling too, it's incredibly helpful for them to hear that. I forgot about all his emotions and how much guilt he would have felt because he knew that he was meant to, you know, be the protector and everything. And just because I carried the baby, I forget that that is our baby. You've got to communicate to one another about, you know, no one's a mind reader. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think at the time, and it's my, just my personality, it was sort of like, well, he doesn't get it, I'll just soldier on. <laughs> the big part of the counselling is, is enabling the, the woman to let her partner know what it is that she needs because it, she doesn't need her partner to fix it. It can't be fixed. Um, she might just need a cuddle or she may just need him to listen. It's perceived, I think, from the partner or the father of this baby that it's their job to make it better and if their wife's crying then they haven't succeeded in their job. Um, so that often can be an area of conflict when a pregnancy is lost. You know, you hear of heaps of people that their marriages break down and and all that sort of stuff, and it's all just because they they don't you know, there's nowhere to turn to, or if there is somewhere to turn to, you you don't feel like you're allowed to. Health is not just about the physical health; it's about our spiritual health. It's about our far now. It's about um, our emotional and intellectual well-being. I got a lot of support from everybody for like a few weeks and then to me it felt like everyone was like, all right, you've had your time, now, you know, back to it. But in fact it was actually getting worse by that point for me. There's lots of different things that can really help the families. So in the under 12 weeks, we can still get the babies dressed, we can pop them in a little um, knitted forever bed or Moses basket and it's just allowing those families that time to be able to spend with baby. We keep the two that we've lost alive with our children, we talk about them, we celebrate them and I think by keeping those memories alive we can let the children know that their siblings were here and that they mattered. For some women it can be incredibly important to keep the baby and the placenta and the umbilical cord and to keep all what, what we might know as the products of conception as scientists but actually for lots of women that's their baby and it may be incredibly important that they're able to take that with them and, and find somewhere to bury it and have a place that they're able to go and, and remember that baby by. So enabling them to do that if that is something that's culturally important and significant is a big part of what we as, as health professionals can offer. <laughs>みずこくよ。うん、お祈りとかしてもらって一緒に家族でお祈りしました。うん。その時はすごく癒されて涙も出て、でも落ち着いた気持ちになれる。一つの儀式をすることで気持ちも落ち着いて次に進める。I think it helps everybody about their feelings because we believe that the spirits go to the, the sky. Mm -hmm. 
So like we, I think it's kind of like the same way that we can say bye bye or something. The reason why I can talk, I can talk about it today, is here. Uh, sometimes I wonder if she is the same spirit who just didn't find it as the right time. It was not the right time for her, and this time she made her way. For a lot of couples, if they do experience a miscarriage, they kind of somehow fall through the cracks in terms of knowing who to go to for help and advice and support. In most parts of New Zealand, your pregnancy is looked after by a midwife, not by your GP. But a lot of people can't get into a midwife until they are 12 weeks or sometimes even slightly beyond that because there is such a demand on midwives. So you may feel like, I don't really know where to go. It was so early um, that we were not told that we should we should find a midwife because and my, my, I assumed that you know I talked to GP, I we did all the tests and all the blood tests. She referred me to, for the ultrasounds. That was a known procedure, but I thought that we have to wait until 12 weeks to find a midwife, which was not the case. If we had a midwife, uh, I could have called her immediately, and she would have send us to the right place and, you know, look after everything. It's really important for them to seek help and so therefore uh, go and see a doctor if it's out of hours. There's lots of emergency um, accident and emergency services around that they need to go and see somebody get checked out and make sure that they're okay. Um, and those emergency services are also set up to uh, provide a, a good service for these women. Uh, え、何か、うん、希望があったりとか、頼りになれたらいいなと思って病院に行った。だけど先生はドクターは、え、何もすることがないって言われて、すごく悲しかったのと絶望感がありました。They just say sorry. うん、手術するかしないかの話しかない。And they will just um introduced to the, the bigger hospital that we can do the surgery to take it out. I had a really junior doctor manage the situation and um, she just, she was very clinical and, and yeah, there wasn't a lot sort of offered and I was there by myself. And going down that route of management, you know, that then there's a few days afterwards really where you're dealing with that. Like literally in the moment, you know, you're dealing with, okay, now, I'm, mis I'm really miscarrying now. And I, yeah, I did feel quite alone in that experience. It was the 23-week loss that was recognised as a little person. So he was recognised as our son. People used his name. Um, he was given a birth certificate because he was born alive and a death certificate because he lived for 45 minutes after birth. Uh, with Dougie, who we lost just after that 12 weeks, it was termed an incomplete abortion. Um, it was referred to as something almost less than human. It was just a medical term. It was not recognised as that was our child or that much wanted baby that we had tried for. As far as places to go for families for support, there seems to be very, very little dedicated to under 12 weeks. There are a a couple of counsellors out there that will specifically deal in the early losses. Um, but definitely if, if they're looking for support, I'd be saying um, find a counsellor that is specialising in bereavement support. I'm still trying to find somebody ongoing to, to keep working through stuff that, that's affordable. A lot of Google research after helped me along with my prayers. That got me through. And then I'd be like, hey, 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 read this. See, it wasn't my fault. And I guess that was just trying to make myself feel better. Going to the um, miscarriage support website is always a good place to start. SANS, um, that's stillborn and neonatal death support, they offer support groups. There is a clinic at National Women's for people who've had repeated miscarriages where they do give supportive care and reassurance and women can phone in whenever they need that reassurance. Um, I think there are some good community groups where women share information about miscarriage. We got given like 
some pamphlets. Yeah, some pamphlets stuff on support. That, to be honest, I didn't really feel that we needed it. Like, I had so much support from my friends and family and yeah. Simon's family that we were able to deal with it in our own way. And I think because we're quite open, just talking about it actually got us through the process of grieving faster than had it been, we kept it to ourselves. I did join the New Zealand Miscarriage page and a worldwide one, but I didn't really feel that I needed that as such. There are some cultures who do have a lot of social support at home and they have a lot of family to help them to get through this. And there are certain cultures where they have absolutely no support, especially when they've come from overseas and they have absolutely no one here. And there are some cultures who do accept miscarriage in a different way and just want to get on with things, whereas some cultures just need a little more support. And a lot of the support groups around the country I know are run by incredible volunteers and often run by people who have experienced miscarriage themselves and realise that there is a huge gap um, and so they have stepped up and filled that, that need for lots of other families coming through which is incredible. Each area has a, a woman based support group where patients can be referred to and we also have um, the Maori health liaison person, where there are systems in place to help them during their grief. And we also have someone from the Asian health as well, so that no one ever feels left out and they have people to go to. The silence of the first trimester isolates women. And that's what we can change and should change. And things that will stop us from doing that are our own indoctrinations. As I talked to other mothers in the months afterwards, I discovered that there's a sense that you are not allowed to talk about your pain and your grief and your loss. And, you know, a sense that if you experience all those things, you are being bit traumatic, um, that you need to get over it. It was only, you know, the, in the first 12 weeks, you know, get over it. It's not really a pregnancy until it's after that 12 weeks. I never knew that existed until my sister had her first baby and she's like, actually, we shouldn't be telling everybody that, that I'm pregnant until 12 weeks. And I said, what? Why is that? Oh, because you could, you know, we could have a miscarriage and if it's, so what? It's, it should be okay anyway. It's a cultural sort of understanding that that's what we do, is that we don't talk about subjects that are scary or emotionally challenging or uncomfortable. And pregnancy loss is uncomfortable for many people. Um, they don't know how to deal with it, they don't know how to comfort people, they don't know what to say in those instances. So we kept very quiet about it because that was the cultural norm. And it wasn't until we lost Dougie that we realised that that was actually really detrimental to us and to our family and to our children. It's always seemed a little bit crazy to me that this sort of line in the sand that before 12 weeks somehow you're not supposed to share the news with anyone and then after 12 weeks it's somehow absolutely safe to tell the whole world. And I don't think that's the case at all. And obviously it's a really, really individual decision when you choose to share the news and who you choose to share it with. Um, but I think historically that came from the fact that the first scan was around about 12 weeks time. So that's the time that you got confirmation that the pregnancy was, was okay and things were going to proceed and were gonna be fine. And so somehow it was okay to share that, but not to share early on in case things didn't go so well. And actually I would say that the first, the first trimester before the 12 week mark is when women need the most support. You might be feeling tired, you don't want to go out drinking with the girls, you just want to go home and rest and um, not be able to tell anybody, it's not necessarily for everyone. If you do end up in a situation where you lose this pregnancy, it does mean if you've kept it silent that actually you get very little support and people don't really understand what you're going through um, or that you then have to go and tell them, well, we were pregnant and now we've lost the baby, which is a much more difficult conversation to have than if you've actually told people that you were pregnant. And you might want to keep that to selected people, you know, who you tell, but um, 
I think it is important to tell some people to get that support. In a very, very traditional way of thinking, it's, um, it's a blessing from God and you must protect it from bad high. So you don't talk about it during the first trimester, maybe with very close female family members to make sure and protect, give a protection from like bad eye and then uh, yeah, until you're safe. Same, on as you if families knew that they could, that it's okay to talk and it's okay to, to cry and it's okay to share your feelings and, and what's going on with others, whether they've been through it or not, you've got that support that can start to happen. But if people don't know you're pregnant in the first place, um, that can make it an extra step for that, for that mum and dad to take before getting support. It can, it can make it harder. It's always after you've had a miscarriage, when you're halfway through dealing with it, that you talk to someone and they tell you that they've been through it too. And I think if it was more normalised, then those yucky, horrible feelings of failure or disappointment. Mm. You know, you can still feel really sad and really gutted that it hasn't worked for you, but not those feelings of kind of failure. We told our families straight away, um, and our close friends as well, and the close friends in France, because they would have known, because I couldn't party with the girls and stuff <laughs> like I could before. We told who we trusted and we were comfortable telling, so... Um, Close family. We told Simon's friends. sisters, his mum, his dad, um, my parents, my brother and his wife and um, quite a lot of my close friends, a few of Simon's close friends. Yeah, just people we really trusted and we wanted to share that joy with. We didn't want us to be just a hidden statistic or our baby to be a hidden statistic. So I've generally been really open about our experience and yeah, I, if I if, well, we're trying still, but yeah. if we get pregnant again, I'd do the same thing. I, for us, we wanted to tell people before the 12 weeks, but we also understand why people would want to wait. Being pregnant is such a joyous occasion for the couple, right? It should be left to them whether they want to tell anyone or they don't want to tell anyone. They shouldn't come under the pressure of the 12-week rule. One in every four New Zealand women have had a miscarriage, with over 20,000 miscarriages occurring each year in our country. My bill proposes a simple change that allows existing bereavement leave to be automatically made available for those who have had a miscarriage or stillbirth. So the Holidays Bereavement for Miscarriage Amendment Bill makes it clear that you're entitled to three days bereavement leave. So currently under the Holidays Act, uh, if you have the death of a child, you're entitled to it. But it was unclear whether a miscarriage uh, qualified under that. Unfortunately, I had a miscarriage a couple of years ago and um, it was a real shock. I hadn't really thought about miscarriage before, hadn't really been on my radar. And I was quite surprised by the level of grief and also, I guess, by the physical process too, because the way people describe it make you think it's not going to be quite as harrowing as it can be. Um, so I was kind of going through and researching my leave entitlements to see how I was going to manage having um, a few days off work. And my workplace was actually really great, but as I was going through and looking at these entitlements, I just realised that um, there was no clear provision for bereavement leave around pregnancy loss. So I got in touch with one of my local MPs, uh, Labour MP Claire Curran in Dunedin. I wrote her a letter and went to have a chat to her and she was really encouraging. So uh, Claire gave it to me. I developed the bill and talked to Catherine and pretty much that's the, that's the beginning of, of where it happened. I commend this going to select committee because as a woman, as a mother that has had a miscarriage, I am also a business owner. Across the house, men and women were supportive of, of this bill in terms of getting it to the next stage. Um, it was really good to sit and listen to the other contributions made from other MPs and other women who I didn't realise 
had gone through this and it highlighted the fact that what we can do as a society to sort of um, help support um, the woman and her husband through this is, is a good thing. The outpouring from the general public was what really made me realise uh, that this was a big issue, that, that, that there was a lot of stuff that we weren't talking about that we probably needed to talk about a lot more. Before this came up, I didn't really give this space much thought. Um, my own personal experience was one that happened, you know, 16 years ago. At the time, I was an employee, I was a business owner. So it, it was something that was kept largely to myself and to my husband. So I think it's it was really good to have the awareness of that. I mean, the process of bereavement for a loss of miscarriage, um, obviously it wasn't really accounted for. So uh, I think it's important that this was brought to light. I think it's going to have a really big impact on individuals and individual couples who will hopefully feel a bit more supported by society when they're going through a process like that, that they can just take that brief and leave if they want to, no questions asked. It's a process of hiding the hidden incident. And while we are hiding what is happening and what we are going through, uh, it's not just a family, your colleagues don't know either. And culturally, we don't share with our managers or colleagues. So it can make it more difficult for you, either as a mom or as a dad, to take leave and explain what happened and why you're not going to the work. I had to use sick leave um, to cover my surgery and my recovery from surgery. It's not something that you particularly want to use annual leave for, but there was no leave available and, and Cam didn't have any sort of recognised leave. He had to take annual leave as well to support me. I think if you could just go to your employer and say, I'll be taking my bereavement leave because of a pregnancy loss, you just don't have to have this huge big conversation about whether or not that's valid. My um, boss was actually really amazing. <laughs> she was really fantastic and she totally would have allowed me the time off and time and space to to um, have it had I wanted it, but you know, that's, I mean, and that's, everyone's different in the way they deal with things too. And I think for some people getting on and keeping busy is one, whether it's the right one or not, is one kind of coping mechanism. Mm. Society is not quite kind to the father either because they expect the mom to grieve and uh, go through all of the, hold, hold the process and do the job. So you are the father, you are the man, and you, you're not kind of allowed to grieve. You're not, uh, you don't have any right to spend time with your family. And As if you're not part of it. Yeah. My work was really, really good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, real good. Um, I had I think, two or three days off straight away and her mum came down and I was back to work. Um, they said if you ever need to go home, just go home. Yeah, mm. they are really good, yeah. Yeah, my work was amazing as well. Um, they just really supportive if I needed anything. My boss was, if you need to take more days off, if you need to go home, if you need to just go for a walk, just do it. He was, yeah, really, really good. Yeah, and they sent me some beautiful flowers too. Beyond this bill, my biggest hope is that we can start supporting people a little bit more when they go through experiences like this. I've heard many stories of, of women being afraid to ask their employer or not knowing what the answer would be. So I, I think if you know you have the right to take that leave, hopefully that encourages um, more women to, to make sure that they, they take it as an entitlement. It's just a really tiny, small change to the Holidays Act that would make it a, a, quite a big difference in the culture. 
an early loss and my first thought was I haven't been a very good friend to my friends who've lost their babies. It was one of my first thoughts because it's so hard as a friend to understand what they've been through and it's not as tangible. People will say things like, oh well, you can try again. Or, um, uh, you know, lots of pregnancies end this way and um, they say things that that they hope will be of use to you. People always want to do the best, um, but don't necessarily realise that it's not what you want to hear in that moment. And really, I think um, what I say to people is if you don't know what to say, just say, I'm so sorry for your loss, and I hope you're okay, and if you need an ear, I'm here. If anyone could have just said to me, what is it that I can do to help you today? Oh, I... probably would have cried but that's what I would need to hear because I know that person is generally there to care for me at that moment.彼女は私を励ますために言ってくれた言葉が私はすごく傷ついて、それ以降母親には話さなくなった。何を言われたかというと、それは龍山というのは世の中にいっぱいある普通にあることだからよくあることだから、しょうがないねって言われたのが。Children are very important in all cultures, incredibly important. And so where women have had miscarriage, sometimes they can hold a lot of shame around that. Each culture will have, have a different value system that they place on a pregnancy loss and then, then Inevitably, if people know about it, they'll project their judgment. And that's often really hard for parents. And what you really need somebody to do is just to sit with you and say, I'm sorry this has happened to you, and just be with you, rather than to be judging you. If I want to be fair, I think at that moment, there was no right thing to say. Especially in the island family, you can't talk with your parents like this. I don't know if it's a embarrassing thing to talk to him about stuff like this. That's why most um, island families, they just keep it in. Because I would never talk like this to my parents. Yeah. It's just hard. <laughs> I think we were the only people who could support each other. Especially I, I, I should have supported her. And I think we were quite lucky that we had somehow educated families uh, who didn't blame us, who didn't blame her. But at the same time, I do understand that some people don't have such a luck. He's got a lot of good mates and, you know, they are supportive, but they were silently supportive. They didn't really message him. They admitted that they didn't know what yeah. to say, so they yeah. said nothing at all. When they yeah. could have just said, Bro, are you all right? Yeah. You know, just, yeah, just something that, you know, all thinking of you. But they, they were always there, obviously. Yeah, I think I talked, like, to my few friends, but they cannot even, yeah, understand because, mis yeah, male to male, even they not married. When you can't understand what someone's going through, it doesn't mean you can, can't still give them the, t the time and space and the kind of permission to feel crappy and feel upset. People will say, oh, you'll get over it, you'll have another one. This baby is the important one right now. This baby is your baby. Um, and families may go ahead and have another baby, but that is not gonna replace this baby. It doesn't matter, you know, how early or how far in pregnancy it was. We made its picture, we imagined that baby with us. The baby was already with us. It was three of us already, and we lost that. I was 
やっぱりリューザーの経験がある人に話して話を聞いてもらうその時の気持ちを共感するっていうだけですごく、うん、励まされたし落ちちょっと落ち着けた。If you're supporting someone, whether you're a family member or a loved one or a friend or a health professional, I think be guided by the person who's in front of you. You know, ask them what they need from you. Don't be afraid to check in, pick up the phone, make sure they're doing okay. And some people will feel absolutely fine, and others will be devastated by this experience. So being there and walking their journey with them, I think, is the important thing. Just think it's, it's important that you, you know that it's okay. To... Feel bad, and then you know if you are seeing a counsellor, tell people. I think what is good to do is to normalise miscarriage as being not everyone's, but many people's normal part of their kind of journey to becoming a parent. But also not downplaying it either. Be there for them. If you've had a similar experience and it's appropriate to share, share it. And just encourage them to talk about it, because、mm. I think for us in our experience, it really did help talking to other people about what we've been through to normalise the fact that we had miscarried. Listening a lot helps, and not offering solutions. There's no solution to this. There's no quick fix or getting over it.、Um, and some of the things that people say when they're awkward or they're trying to、uh, give their condolences, oh, you can try again. Oh, there was something wrong with the baby. Oh, you're young. Oh, you've already got children. Those things are meant with kindness and love, but actually can be quite hurtful. Sit there and let them cry. And I, I will not try to reason with them. Logic doesn't always work. It's really important to talk about. This as part of our womanhood, as part of our this part of our lives where we are able to bear children or not able to bear children. You know, like we are so good at talking about some things, but this one is harder. Let boys and men in on these conversations so that they can, you know, be a part of the journey of、um, of happiness and and grief and loss and triumph. I don't like it when an individual feels suppressed with their feelings, especially around miscarriages. So, I certainly would like to see this being normalised. What we're helping families to do is to learn to live with their grief, to have something to hold, regardless of baby's age. What I'd like to see going forward is that these under 12-week families that they do have the full range of support that over 12-weekers、um, get. We just have to recognise that any type of loss is significant, and how those people need to deal with it will be very different and very individual, and not one quick solution fixes everything. I was so afraid when.、Uh... When I was pregnant with, with Tara, that I did not fantasize anything with her, not even after I started feeling the movements, because some part of me I, I loved her so dearly. On the other hand, I, I tried to protect myself from the pain in case I lose it.、Um, so yeah, that was my defense. <laughs> For most women. A miscarriage will be a one-off event. You know, by far the majority of women that have a miscarriage will go on to have normal, full-term, successful pregnancies again. And I think when you're you're in the middle of a miscarriage, you've had a miscarriage, you're grieving for the loss of that pregnancy.、Um, it's really important to hold on to that piece of information that this doesn't mean you're never going to have a baby. We're really grateful that we've got three kids now.、Um, But we have a truckload of empathy for those out there who are still trying and going through that miscarriage because, yeah, it's a really, it's a really nasty space to be in. The fact that for many mums this loss of pregnancy that's their baby, and we need to be 
really careful as a society and as a, a, a health care service to treat it as that because I've sat with moms who at six weeks have lost a baby and for them that's their baby and um, you know the, the traumas of what's happened to it, where's it gone, all of those kinds of things are enormous and parents live with trauma for a long time if we don't deal with that in a, in a compassionate way. Those yucky feelings of failure come back for me you know whenever you go and have uh, medical history taken or anything like that and they ask all females how many pregnancies they've had and how many babies they've had and that's always a yucky question because it does just bring back those feelings oh actually you know I've had six pregnancies but only three babies. We've always said to people talk to us about our children our children were important and yes they're no longer with us but the two babies we lost are a part of our family and always will be and we want them acknowledged to us they were real and we want everyone else to know that they were real yeah. Everything will be all right. <laughs> <laughs> the one message that I want people to get is that don't blame yourself for a miscarriage. There are medical reasons why someone miscarries. It is not planned to miscarry and it is no one's fault. It's important that women hear that there is nothing that you have done that has caused the loss of your baby. This is completely out of your control, but it's what she feels that's important. Yeah, so we can say anything, can't we, to someone, but if they don't feel that, that they're really not gonna hear it. We know now to just open up more about our feelings. Especially with the situation we were in, um, it's good to be open and talk to someone. It's not, you know, it's not an embarrassing topic, it's not an embarrassing thing. It's good to open up and talk. Find a way to celebrate the babies. Yeah, yeah. We found several ways of doing that. We actually planted a camellia plant, little tree, mm. um, that's going to flower in May, which is when the baby should be born. So it's a way of every time walking out in May at our house and seeing something there. Um, we also got for our Christmas tree just something we could put up so that baby would be a part of our life for years to come and I've got an angel that lights up and a hummingbird which kind of represents the essence of life and being. Um, yeah, so there's a few things we've done to honour what was our baby year. It would just be great for it to be normal to talk about miscarriage. I think it would make the whole grieving process a lot easier because when you're grieving by yourself it's hard but if you can grieve yeah. together it makes it a bit easier. I think that the more that we can be open and talk about um, issues that have been perceived as something we shouldn't talk about, the better we are. And I, I just think if there's a new generation of, of young people growing up with confidence that they can ask a question and get a straight answer, then we're improving and that's, that's good.